Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 3. If you've got a Bible, I strongly encourage you to open up to Romans chapter 3. Um, it's really important because these are probably some of the most pivotal verses in the entire Bible. Now, this morning, in, in our time together, we're going to talk about um, a Latin phrase and a Greek word, and if you're the tattoo kind of person, the best tattoo you could possibly get. Those are the three things that we're going to cover this morning, and when we get done with those three things, you can tap out, right? But those are the three points I'm going to make today. One is a, is a, is a Latin phrase, one's a Greek word, and the other one is the best Christian tattoo you could ever get, okay? All right, here we go. Now, I'm not condemning nor condoning tattoos by that statement. I'm just saying if you're the tattoo person, fine. I'll have office hours this week for all of those of you who are upset with the fact that I mentioned tattoos in a sermon. Um, my email address is dalton at livingwordgalena.com. <laughs> Why have an intern if you can't throw them under the bus periodically, right? Okay, so, no, no, so, so here we go. So we're going to go... Uh, setting this whole thing up, right? We're going to be in Romans chapter 3. Now, the most important and pivotal verse of the entire uh, book of Romans happens right here in, in chapter 3. And we're going to start uh, kind of midway through our section, and then we're going to double back and, and go around it again. Okay, so Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the operating principle behind the entire uh, section here. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, some things we need to keep in mind when we talk about sin. If you remember the word sin is an archery term. It comes out of the idea of, of shooting a bow and arrow at a target. And if you miss the target's bullseye, it was said to be a sin, right? Anything other than perfect is missing the mark. That's what the word sin means, to miss the mark. Now, so what this is, is so Paul's going to set this up. So for all have missed the mark and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single last person on the face of the planet has done something wrong where they have missed the mark. We've all pulled the arrow of our works back and we've let it go and we've missed the mark at least once. At least once. Maybe you've done it more like me, but, but at least one time you've got to admit you've missed the mark. And so Paul is going to start here, and he's going to build this entire thought process around the idea that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let's go back now to verse 21. Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Now, now this, this, is, this is an important piece of the story. So there's this this church in Rome that, that Paul's writing to, and it's Jewish Christians, and it's Roman Christians, and they're fighting over rules and laws and rituals and traditions and all the things. They think that it's their rituals and all of those obedience moments that are going to save them. They think it's the law that's going to somehow save them. And so what Paul does here is he, he comes in and says, you're righteous, you can be declared righteous, but it doesn't come through the law. The law's function is not to make you right. The law's function is only to show you what's wrong. That's the only purpose of the law. The entirety of the law is to show you what's wrong. I mean, think about it. You have this, this rectangular sign on the side of the road. It's got two numbers in the middle. And, and no matter how fast you go, that sign is not going to make you right. Never. It'll never make you right. The purpose of a speed limit is not to make you slow down. It's to make you fear what happens if you don't slow down. Let's use another illustration. Uh, let's say you, you, you're feeling not so well. And, and when you feel not so well, sometimes you run a bit of a fever. You're kind of sweaty, you're cold and clammy, but you're hot all at the same time. You don't know what's going on, so you take your temperature. You get one of those dealios and you stick it underneath your tongue, which I don't even think those exist anymore. So they got the ones that kind of swoop across your forehead or shove it inside your ear. Don't know how either one of those work, but it's not my job to know how they work. So you swipe the little thing across your forehead and you look at it and it says 102.4. Your fever goes away, right? As soon as you take your temperature, your fever goes away. No, a thermometer doesn't fix the problem. It just tells you what the problem is. A thermometer doesn't say, okay, now that I'm 102.4 fever, now I'm all of a sudden better. No, a thermometer says, now I need to figure out what I can do to get better. Okay, so the law is kind of like a thermometer. The law is swipe it across your forehead, 102.4. The law is, wow, you done messed up, son. 
That's really all the law does. The only thing the law does is it tells you there's a problem. It doesn't fix anything. The law doesn't make it better. It doesn't make you feel better. Like when you swipe that thingy across your forehead and it says 102.4, you don't feel better. Actually, you probably feel worse. Like you felt crummy and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I've got 102.4 fever. I probably should feel really bad and I'm going to go to bed now. That's what the law does. So the righteousness of God has come into the world. It's been manifest. It's been shown to us, but it didn't come through the law because the only thing the law does is it shows our sin. It shows the brokenness. It shows the breakdown in our lives. It just simply shows the reality of where we are. It's again like a mirror. We talked about this before, right? A mirror can only show you what it sees. It doesn't change your reality, right? Just a, just a flat mirror. It doesn't make you look fatter or thinner. It doesn't add pimples. It doesn't take them away. It just, and it doesn't give you hair if you're bald or black hair if you're gray-haired, whatever. It doesn't do that. It just simply reflects back exactly what it sees. That's what the law does. The law simply reflects back exactly what it sees. And so Paul writes, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So God's righteousness comes in in a way that it, it's not about showing wrong, so it comes in another way. Now the law and the prophets, they bear witness to this righteousness. They bear witness to the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So what Paul's doing is he's saying, look, you're not going to be made right by doing good works. You're not going to be made right by obeying the law. You're not going to be made right if you obey all those cool Ten Commandments. You're not going to be made right if you follow the list of rules that Dalton wrote down on a little piece of paper. That doesn't make you righteous. What makes you righteous is by leaning in to the things that Jesus did for you. That's what the word faith is all about. Faith is the act of leaning into the completed work of Jesus. It's like falling into what Jesus completed on my behalf. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the background, the setup to this whole thing, right? So the law can't do it. Merely faith in Jesus can. The only thing that works is faith in Jesus Christ. And that is where righteousness comes from. Now, Paul's going to jump into a couple other things uh, in, in these next few verses. Uh, so we're going to skip verse 23 because we already did that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified uh, by his grace as a gift. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and they're justified by his grace. Now this word justified is a big word. It's a big word that, that we don't talk about a lot. As a matter of fact, this big word is the word that changed Martin Luther's mind. This word is the word that started the Reformation. The word justified is the word that kicked off what we have now as the Reformation. So in the 1500s, Martin Luther was part of the Roman Catholic Church. And as he's part of the Roman Catholic Church, they're, they're going through all of their teaching and all of their belief systems. And, and as they're talking about this idea of justification or justified, they look at the word as a process right? Justification takes place over a long period of time by a certain set of, of obedience rituals. So the Roman Catholic Church defined it as, if you were to be justified, in order to be justified, you had to go through all seven of their sacraments, right? Uh, baptism, confirmation, catechism, like all the things, right? Communion, all the deals, right? And if you couldn't get through all seven, you went to a place called purgatory to purge your story. Purgatory, purge, to purge it out of you, right? So you had to go there to, to suffer or, to, or for somebody else to pray for you so that all of the failures in your life would be purged out of you. And it all stemmed from a false understanding of what the word justified is. See, they thought that justified was a process. They thought it was something that would happen over a lengthy period of time. But what happened was Luther started to look at the actual original language. He looked at the Greek word for justified and he realized Oh, this is a legal term. It's like a one-time thing. It's a legal term in the sense that it's a declaration. Justified. Picture it this way. You are on trial for committing a crime. And you are in the defendant's seat. And the prosecutor makes his or her case. And your defense attorney makes their case. And the judge stands up or, or sits in his seat and smacks the gavel down and says, not guilty, not enough evidence, not guilty. 
When that gavel strikes, that judge never turns to you and says, okay, now that you're not guilty, I want you to do 500 hours of community service and I want you to enter into these classes. No, no, no. If you're not guilty, the judge says, I am so sorry for the pain and anguish that this trial took for you and the repercussions to your name and all the things. But the judgment's the judgment. It's spoken, declared, it's done. So what Paul does here is he says, look, you're not made righteous by works of the law. You're made righteous through faith in Jesus because even though everyone sins, we can be declared just or righteous by the grace of God as a gift. Now, kids, I want you to pay attention real quick. Kids, young people, look up here. Ready? Okay. When you get a gift for your birthday, what do you do to earn the gift? It starts with N and rhymes with a thing. Nothing. You do nothing to earn the gift. Like, even if, even if you're not a really nice little child, even if you've hit your brother or sister, even if you ate your dessert before your supper, even if you didn't eat your peas, which by the way are one of the best vegetables out there, even if you still get your birthday present. Because a gift doesn't require you to do anything. Because a gift is a gift. And so what Paul says is, you're justified by God's grace, which is a gift. Now, there's another, I think my, my this is my phrase, yeah. yeah. So, anybody read this? I didn't, I didn't mess up. Like I didn't, like the caps lock wasn't on by accident, I didn't accidentally fumble through there, and it wasn't just one of those ones where I sat down, I'm like, type whatever I think. That's kind of what that looks like, doesn't it? It looks like, like a cat walked across a keyboard and just picked some letters. So this is, a, this is a Latin phrase, and by the way, this is the phrase you should put is if you're gonna get a tattoo. If you're a tattoo person, and you want a tattoo that's gonna really make somebody ask questions, this would be the one. Like, this is legitimately the best Christian tattoo ever. Like, better than a cross, better than a cool little fishy deal. Like, this is it, right here. This is it. Simul justus et peccator. Simul justus et peccator. Simul, simultaneously, justice, justified, et, and, Peccator, sin, sinner. Simultaneously justified while at the same time being caught up in my sin. Simultaneously justified and sinner. Like, could you imagine walking up to somebody and reading that on their arm and like, hey, what's your tattoo mean? Well, actually it means the entire gospel is wrapped up in this one phrase. Because while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. He came into my life, he died for me. When I didn't deserve it, like I was still far from him, I hated him, I didn't even know he existed. And he died and rose for me to make me right with God and I didn't have to do anything for it. Like could you imagine that conversation happening? When Bible and Brew got started over at Matt the Miller's, and we were sitting there at one of our tables and, and a young lady was bringing our drinks and, and our food in and she reached her hand in in front of me. And I've told this story before. She, she placed the plate in front of me and written on the inside of her wrist just, behind, just before the palm of her hand so that she could read it was the word hope, but it was written in Hebrew. And she placed that thing right in front of me and I, I saw it on her wrist and ne never do this, like never ever do this, this is a bad idea. Like you could probably get hit for this right now. She put that plate there and I grabbed her arm and I pulled it up like this and I'm like, do you know what that says? <laughs> never do that by the way, never grab another person's arm. Bad idea, right? Especially when it's a female and you're at a table full of guys, bad idea. <laughs> but she says, yeah, it's on my wrist, of course I know what it means. So what does it say? She goes, it's hope. It's the word for hope. I said, I know, but why do you have it there? She said, well, it's written in Hebrew because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and it's the word hope because my only hope is found in the God who was the Hebrew God who sent his son Jesus to die for me. I'm like, ha, hot dog, that's pretty cool. Like, literally, I was blown away by this young lady who had the word hope tattooed on her wrist. But if you would have had simul justus et peccator in there, it would have been a whole nother story. Like we could have had a theological conversation for days. So it's probably good she just had hope because we had to leave at some point. So what Paul's doing in this is he's saying, look, look, you're justified by the free gift of God's grace. While you're still a sinner, Christ declares you not guilty. Christ declares you innocent. Now, now this is a really cool picture. 
This is a super cool picture because all throughout the Old Testament, they had this structure that was part of the Old Testament with the, the whole lamb sacrifice deal. Right, so families would get a lamb and they'd place it on an altar and the father would lay his hand on the, the lamb's head and he'd speak the sins of the family upon the lamb and then they'd slit, slit, slit the ram, lamb's throat. Sorry for the bad picture, kids, I'm so sorry. And the belief was that the lamb's blood would cover their sins. But they also had this thing where uh, once a year the priest would gather a, a, a goat and bring it into the temple and ceremoniously would place his hand on the goat's head and would speak the sins of the people on this goat, uh, symbolically transferring all of their collective sin onto this goat, and then they would send that goat out, representing that their sins have been taken away from them and never would return again. Most people didn't know it, but they had somebody stationed outside the walls of the city to grab the goat and chuck it off a cliff so it didn't accidentally come back in because that would have been a bad day. Like they did, because you wouldn't want the goat to come back. Because that just says the ne negative. Never mind. So, like, so he says. So he says here, you're getting way too much insight here. Okay. So they're justified by God's grace as a gift, which means that while you're still stuck in all the stuff of your sin, while you're still stuck in the sinful moments, while you are stuck in all of the most awful, horrendous things you could possibly be doing, God looked at you through the cross and said, innocent, simul justus et peccator. You see sin, I see my son, saved. So make sure we're all on the right track here. What do you do to deserve a birthday gift? Nothing. Nothing. What do you do to deserve the grace of God? Nothing. And seven of you got it. Hopefully by the end we've got it better, right? But simultaneously, justified by God, while I'm still a sinner, I don't do anything to earn God's grace. I don't do anything to receive that justification. I am simply declared, gavel, drop, saved. When Jesus spoke that final word on the cross to Telestai, he said, it is done. That word is a financial term that means paid in full. And so when he said, it is finished, paid in full, he says, simul justus et peccator. They are sinners, declared just and righteous by my blood. This is, why, this is why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus walking, he saw Jesus coming up and he goes, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because he knew that none of those lambs could have done it. He knew that, no, that the scapegoats couldn't have healed them. He knew that somebody was coming who one day would have to redeem them. And he knew that it was Jesus. So they're justified. We're justified by grace as a gift of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this is the second word that we, we're going to talk about today, and it's not, not a word we talk about all that often. Like, we don't walk around going, talking about redemption or redeeming something very often. Uh, anybody, the, the, best, the best image I can give you, do you remember the old uh, paper coupons? I don't even know if they make paper coupons anymore. I don't do grocery shopping. I'm not allowed to. Um, I'm just not. It doesn't end well. Budget goes totally out the window. Paper coupons, do they still have those things? I remember, I remember sitting with my wife when we first got married. We would sit down and we'd get the Sunday paper and we'd sit down in the living room and, and we'd sit on the couch and I'd go through the ads for electronics and home repairs and she'd go through the grocery ads and she'd make her list and then we would go through and we'd cut the coupons. Like the little paper dealios and you cut on the dotted lines and I was never really caring about the dotted lines and she cared way more than I did about the dotted lines. And we'd get all these things cut up and she would take those and stack them up by grocery store because she used to like comparison shop and like, you know, Aldi here and Kroger here and Meyer here. And like, she spent like 12 and a half days grocery shopping. It was phenomenal. <clears throat> but she did it all in a day. I don't know how she did it. But she'd take those coupons and she'd take the stack of coupons for Kroger to Kroger, the ones from Meyer to Meyer. Do you know how much those, those little paper coupons are worth? I mean, like if I take the coupon that says I get a free butterball turkey. And if I take that into Best Buy... Will they give me an iPad? I mean, if I take my coupon for a Butterball turkey to the, to the bank, will they give me any money for it? They're going to look at me strange and say, you're nuts. But if I take that same coupon into the grocery store and I give it to the clerk, she's going to ring up my turkey and she's going to say, I don't know how much a turkey is today with inflation and all that, maybe 300 bucks. I don't know. I'm just kidding. That was a joke, right? But if I give them, if I give them that coupon, 
That coupon that costs me nothing, they redeemed that coupon for a free turkey. Didn't cost me a penny. It cost the manufacturer the money because they had to pay for that turkey. This is what redemption means, right? So we're justified as a free gift of God's grace because God redeemed his son for us. He exchanged his son. His son was the coupon that gave us redemption. God is worth way more than a coupon, by the way, but it's the best image I could give you, okay? So we've got, you're justified not by works of the law, but because Jesus died in your place and he rose again, and now God says, I'm giving my son for you. So when Jesus went to the cross, he died the death we should have died. He rose the life that we could never earn, but he gave it to us anyway. And he says, saved. Similar use of Epicator. Saved. Redeemed. Justified. Whom God put forward as a propitiation. Show of hands, how many of you use propitiation in your conversations this week at work? I didn't think so, Right? So God put forward Jesus, put Jesus forward as a propitiation for your sins. Now, the word propitiation is the Greek word hilasterion. Everybody say it. Hilasterion. Great, you guys are Greek scholars. It means, another way to put it is atoning sacrifice. Here's the official definition. That which serves as an instrument for regaining the goodwill of a deity. That which serves as an instrument for regaining the goodwill of a deity. Here's the picture. The picture is this. You and I are sinners. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that the wages of sin is death. We know that because we have sinned, we deserve to die. But God, in his grace and mercy, sent Jesus to be the propitiation, the one who would take our place, the one who would appease the wrath of God. Somebody's got to die for your sins. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says your sins are deserving of somebody's death. You can do it, or you can let Jesus be the propitiation by his blood. In other words, you can let Jesus' death be enough for you. This is how you can be simul justus et peccator, simultaneously justified and still be a sinner. So he says, God put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. Because, he goes on to the end, in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. This is so cool. So the Old Testament, when they did the whole sacrifice thing with the lamb and all that, their sins, their sins weren't forgiven. Their sins weren't erased. Their sins weren't done away with. God just passed over them. God just was like, going to jump over those for a hot minute. We got to just stay tuned, right? There's like the sequel's coming. And the sequel in this case was better than the original. Doesn't happen very often that way, by the way. So, you know, he passed over their sins. Isaiah chapter uh, 1 verse 11 says, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. God, God isn't, isn't appeased by some innocent animal dying. God is only appeased by a sacrifice that is meaningful and fulfilling. And so when we were justified by God's grace, when God redeemed his son for our behalf, who was the propitiation to absorb God's wrath, he had passed over every sin before that. But in that moment, forgiveness entered the world. When Jesus died, he paid the penalty for every sin past present, future. Every sin was paid for when Jesus went to the cross because all the sins of the world fell on Jesus. One sacrifice for all humanity for all time. And he made the blood of goats and rams and bulls mean something by his own blood. Martin Luther, when he talks about this idea of simul justus et peccator, when he talks about this idea of justified and redeemed and the propitiation, he, I'm going to paraphrase what he says. He, he says, in, in his talk about justification, he, he says that on the cross, Jesus became the worst of all sinners. He became the murderer of all murderers, the, the greatest thief, the most horrible liar, the cheater among cheats. He became the worst of all sinners. It is as if the Father told Jesus that on the cross you will become Peter, the denier, Paul, the persecutor, David, the adulterer, 
Adam, the first sinner who ate the fruit and brought the world spiraling out of control. You will become all things that brought pain and shame into the world. You're going to become the drug addict, the proud, the hypocrite. You're going to become the apathetic. You're going to become all of these things for all of them so that my people can be declared innocent by your death. This is what it means for my sin to become his and his righteousness to become mine so that I can be simul justus et peccator. Jesus became my worst moment so that I could become his greatest blessing. What an amazing thing that Paul does. It's no wonder that this section was the most powerful section for the Reformation. And he's going to wrap this up with this last verse here. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justice demands that punishment happens. The justifier is the one who pays the penalty. And so God, because of his son Jesus, is going to levy the punishment, and pay the price at the same time. Going back to our courtroom metaphor, this is like the the judge declaring you guilty, slamming down the gavel, and then serving your sentence so that you can go free. This is what Jesus did when he went to the cross. He said, you're guilty, peccator, but at the same time that you're guilty, you're saved, justified, redeemed by my blood. Simul Eustace et peccator. Maybe you'll get it on a tattoo. Maybe it'll become your screensaver. Maybe you'll just plaster it somewhere for people to see. But those words should change everything about how you see God and how you see yourself. Because when God sees you, he doesn't see sinner. He sees justified saint, adopted child. Because Jesus paid your penalty for you. You are simul justus et peccator because of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we are so grateful that you declare us just and righteous, not because of our works, but because of your son's works. We are so grateful that upon the cross, as Jesus stretched out his arms, he absorbed our sin. He became our sin so that we could become righteous in your eyes. Help us to receive this with grace. Help us to have this change us and transform us so that the world might see you in us. May our faith be far more than words. May it be an entire lifestyle built around being justified sinners bought by the grace of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.